Hey everybody, church, good to see you again. Well, or at least to be seen by you. I haven't been uh, with you over the last few weeks, but I've uh, been busy writing a book and traveling and doing all kinds of stuff that um, maybe I'll tell you about later. Um, I, I have very much missed uh, our communication and I've just kind of been offline. I've got about another month to be offline, frankly, because I'm trying to get a book written. Uh, this book that I've been telling you about, the working title right now is The Good News You Never Needed and The Great News You Never Heard. The good news you never needed is that you can be reunited with God and the great news you never heard was you were never separated. Of course, if you've been around me very long, you've heard that theme iterated and reiterated again and again and again. So thanks for the grace right now. Uh, you're a big part of my life and I hope I'm a big part of yours. What I wanted to do and kind of have felt inspired to do as I've been thinking about uh, the next few messages uh, with you is I kind of wanted to tell a bit of my story. You guys have heard my story in bits and pieces here and there, and instead of cobbling it together in your mind and trying to put it all into a cogent frame, I thought I would just kind of start and tell you a bit of my journey, my spiritual journey, my Christian journey, and specifically my journey with this thing called deconstruction and reconstruction, or as some like to call it, new construction, because reconstruction kind of connotes putting together, you know, the same thing. But Anyway, I just wanted to kind of go back, and I, I think our stories are important because to some degree, as much as uh, the numerators are different, there are so many common denominators, uh, the names and the chase, kind of like Dragnet for those that remember the old show, the names and the places have been changed, but the story is essentially the same. And I think when we share our stories, uh, as I've learned in the 12-step world, there is a transfer of hope and encouragement and just a sense that, you know, I'm not crazy, that I'm not the only one going through this. I'm not the only one that's experienced this. I'm not the only one thinking this. So maybe I tell my story not so you'll have more information about me, but maybe I tell my story and we tell our stories so that we'll drive each of us back into our own heart, into our own soul, into our own story to recognize how important the days and the events and the people and the places and the books, all of those things that are kind of the alphabet of grace, Frederick Buechner said, that God pieces together and speaks messages of love to us through those mediums. Where to start, where to start? I, uh, I, was, I was born a fifth generation Pentecostal. Uh, not just any Pentecostal, but a specific little group of Pentecostals called Oneness Pentecostals. We were the folks that thought the Assembly of God and the Church of God were liberal. Um, we, we were holiness Pentecostal people who were very stringent on what we call standards. Our women couldn't cut their hair. I remember feeling like the earth was going to swallow me if my hair touched my ears or my collar. As a little boy, uh, I wasn't supposed to play Little League Baseball because it was considered a worldly amusement. We couldn't have televisions in our homes. We couldn't go to the movies. When the kids at school got on a bus and went to Bambi, we couldn't go because it was a worldly amusement and something about old Walt Disney was trying to steal our soul. I didn't know exactly what it was. I just knew that there was a lot of evil down there in that Disneyland park. Uh, that's who we were. We, our, our people were wonderful people, sincere people. I am not one of these post-evangelical people that look back and sit around and lick my wounds and talk about how horrible it was. Uh, the, the ideas, many of the ideas indeed were horrible, um, deplorable actually. But I don't remember horrible people. I don't remember deplorable people. As a matter of fact, I remember the opposite. I remember a lot of wonderful people doing the best they could with the information they had. That's just the way I, I not only choose to look at it, but I viscerally feel inside. These were wonderful people that were a big part of my life. My great-great-granddad was a Pentecostal preacher. They called him Uncle Fate, actually. He never had a pulpit in terms of a local church, but he preached in logging communities all over Louisiana and Arkansas. My granddad, his grandson-in-law, would be my maternal grandfather, my mom's dad, was his grandson-in-law, and 
Uh, my granddad's one of the finest men I ever knew, uh, never given to hyperbole or exaggeration. If he told a story, it stayed static for 60 years. But my granddad has vivid memories of Uncle Fate, again, his grandfather-in-law handling snakes in church. Uh, that is a caricature of the Pentecostal movement, but there were little aberrant groups of Pentecostals. Even to this day, they still exist in pockets of the Southeast and especially Kentucky and Appalachia. But back in those days, in the early days of Pentecost, in the teens and 20s, Pentecostal preachers would be challenged on, on the text at the end of Mark's Gospel. The text that said those who followed Christ would speak with new tongues, and if they took up serpents, the serpents wouldn't harm them. If they drank deadly things, the deadly things would not uh, harm them as well. And uh, in the early days of the Pentecostal movement, coming out of the Holiness Wesleyan Methodist movement, the real distinction for Pentecostals at the early part of the 20th century was that they believed the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or as Wesleyan people call it, the second work of grace, was to always be accompanied by glossolalia, which is a fancy word for tongue speaking this supernatural endowment where a person would speak in languages that they were not naturally trained in or given to. So the Pentecostals made a big deal out of the fact that the baptism of the Holy Spirit always had to be accompanied by tongue speaking. They were immediately taken to task by uh, folks from the Baptist and Methodist and non-Pentecostal church world on this text in Mark. And, and the challenge was, that Mark said not only would you speak in tongues, but you would also handle serpents. So if you're going to be consistent, you've got to do all of this. Um, I, I still don't know exactly what the good argument back on that is, and so instead of arguing back, people like my Uncle Fate allowed them to test him. One particular night, my granddad said he remembered Uncle Fate preaching, and as he was preaching, somebody brought a burlap sack and set it down beside the pulpit in that old Brush Arbor open-air meeting. And Granddad said, I kept watching that burlap sack shift and squirm, and obviously there were snakes inside of it. And as Uncle Fate was preaching under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, he felt inspired to reach down and take that sack. My Granddad said he reached inside that sack, and as the burlap sack slipped off, I think it was his left arm, as it slipped off his left arm, um, a snake was wrapped from his wrist almost up to his elbow, and the mouth was attached to his hand that was just pumping. And my granddad said that Uncle Fate kept preaching until finally the snake uncoiled. I know this is freaking some people out right now. It's kind of freaking me out as I tell it. Um, hang with me, there's a point here. And the snake fell off and, of course, slithered away. Now, as I reflect back on that, you know, it, I, I suppose that it was supposed to be a copperhead or a cottonmouth. It was probably an old water snake with teeth like a dog, and it wasn't poisonous. But that story, you know, grew and accreted lore over time. But that's the world that I come from. My great-granddad got a little more refined and was a pastor, and they didn't handle snakes. And then my grandparents, wonderful church people, and continue to refine in the Pentecostal world. My parents were not in the ministry, but they were like the preacher's best friend, and they raised us in that little world. Uh, in that world, if you were especially a male, and you showed a little precociousness and zeal, you would pretty quickly, as a teenager, be conscripted, pulled up, enlisted into the ministry. And that happened to me at 16. I was in a car accident shortly after I started driving, almost died. And in that world, when you had a near-death experience or a scary experience like that, it generally would drive you back to the altar. And as a 16-year-old kid who was living a wanton life of sin, playing high school baseball and basketball and going to G-rated movies, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but it's really true, I felt like I had backslidden. I let my hair get a little bit long. I, 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 I didn't, I was like Johnny Carson. I used to go out behind the barn and do nothing. But in that world, the nothing that I did made me feel backslidden. And this near-death experience so traumatized me that the next Wednesday night I went to the altar and rededicated my life to God. Underneath that burning car, thinking I was about to burn up in the accident, I remember making promises to God that if God would spare my life, it was the quintessential story. If God would spare my life, I would serve Him, of course, all the days of my life. 
and I was spared. Uh, I was extracted from the accident. I still don't know exactly how that happened. Uh, in the early days, I told it as a supernatural story, and I don't know how to process all of that now. I don't process it. I'm just glad I lived. But I went to an altar, rededicated my life, and told the Lord I'd preach. The next Wednesday night, my pastor asked me to testify. I stood up and testified. This might be a surprise to some of you, but I went a good while. And after going a good while in the testimony, my pastor looked at me and said, why don't you give the sermon next Wednesday night? And that was August 1st, 1984. Good Lord, 35 years ago. I got up and I preached. I preached a message called A Comforting Hope, all about heaven. And I preached about 20 minutes and the altars filled up and the rest was history. I was off to the races. By 18, I was preaching all over the country. By 19, I was preaching, gosh, 250 nights a year. Um, academics were not a big thing in that movement. They were almost poo-pooed to some extent. Uh, I took the message that we had, which we believed was the exclusive truth. We literally did. Our little group believed that we were the restoration movement. Um, of the Christian church, that the church literally had been dead since the first century. And, and some of this will probably give you perspective on my life. A lot of people say, well, obviously the reason Stan has become so liberal is because he started so conservative. And, you know, I'm not here to argue that point. I, I don't feel like that's been my journey, but it's an easy, it's an easy point to make uh, when you hear the story of my life uh, from my opponents. But I, I, I was preaching in that little world, we were the only group. We were the restoration group. We, we literally believed the church had essentially been dead for 18 centuries until our group refound this revelation that we called the oneness of God. And um, I won't go into all of those details. What I, I will say is that I made it to about 20 years old as a young preacher in that movement. I made it to about 20 without one question without there being one sliver, one pinhole of light of question. Uh, there was not one fissure, one crack, one fault line in the constitution of my theology by the time I was 20 years old. I had never wondered if there was a God. I had never wondered if Jesus was the ultimate manifestation of that God. I had never even questioned if our group truly had the truth. Um, I was certain. So I, I remember what I now refer to as the comfort of certainty. I remember what it was like to not hope or believe, but I remember what it was like to truly know. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that what I was preaching was the truth. I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that people like Max Licato and Billy Graham were lost because they weren't in our group. I've kidded and I say this tongue-in-cheek, but there's a lot of validity to it. And in that little exclusivistic world, when we talked about comparative world religions, we were talking about the Methodist and the Baptist, not the Hindus and the Buddhists. That's how narrow that we were. And I, I made it till I was 20 with no questions. Not one ounce of deconstructive energy in my life. There was no question that we had the truth, that we were the harbingers of the truth. One of the difficult things about being reared in that world was I, I would like to say that we thought we were the only ones saved, but that, that's not even accurate because most of our people didn't really feel like we were saved. We were so incredibly, unconditionally, eternally insecure in our relationship with God um, that we were always desperately trying to reassure ourselves of our salvation. I remember one time preaching for a, an elderly couple up in Illinois, and the pastor's wife there is one of the most precious women I've ever met in my life. She was an austere, holy woman in the strictest sense of that word, kind and gentle, the spirit of Jesus all over her. And she had lived that life her entire life, never cut her hair, always wore dresses, no makeup, no jewelry, a life of complete austere holiness from that perspective. And she was in her upper 70s at the time, and I remember talking to her one night after one of the revival services that I had preached, and she mentioned 
how much she would love to one day just know. Just know, she said. I would love to just know. And she looked away wistfully, and I remember asking her, know what? And I called her name. She said, I'd just like to know that when the trumpet sounds, or when I lay my head to rest the final time, that I truly am, I'll never forget the phrase, she said that I truly am the Lord's and the Lord is mine. And I remember looking at her, I, I knew my own deep insecurities because we were so convinced that sin separated from God, there was never any assurance. We were always having to ask for repentance and get our, you know, get our name stamped uh, or, or get our ticket stamped again. And I remember being surprised that such a lovely, elderly, gorgeous Christian woman would question her salvation. And I asked her, I said, so you really don't know? And she said, oh, Brother Stan, I've never known. I just hope. And that was the tragedy of that world. And I think it's one of the reasons that our really strict fundamentalism mixed so well with the mysticism of Pentecost, because within the Pentecostal mystic tradition, we were not only cerebrally, intellectually knowing things, but we had many occasions and many opportunities around our altars and in our music to have feelings, to, to have experiences that we believed were the touch of God's hand. And, and so when, when you mix a desperate insecurity of wondering if God is always leaving you, it's, it's like a Barbara Streisand song coming in and out of your life, you mix that insecurity with the capacity or the potential theologically to touch God and to be touched by God. It was those touches of God, whether it was tongue speaking or prophesying or just feeling the goosebumps run up and down your spine and the good old altar service. It was those moments that we were assured, that we were, that we were reassured that, that God was indeed with us. I remember thinking as a child, I hope God comes on a Sunday night right after a really good altar service because that's probably the best chance I've got because I've had a, a real good run of repenting and asking God to forgive me and I've had a really good run of feeling the presence of God. I remember I used to feel goosebumps as a child and I used to feel goosebumps that would start up behind my ears uh, and, and my spine just kind of run down my shoulders and down my legs. And, and, and for me, that experience of goosebumps was synonymous with the presence of God moving over me. I, I think back to all of this now, even telling the story, it, it, it causes me just to, uh, I don't know, just to reflect and be so grateful for the journey that I've been on out of that type of desperate insecurity. When I, when I talk about that young man, that child, I have such compassion for who I was then. And there's so many parts of my life that I've had to take responsibility for, that I've had to change, that I've had to mature, that I've had to repent of, that I've, I, I, that I've, I've regretted. But in the midst of all of those regrets and repentance, I look back and I can give myself the same grace that I give those that I was with. I was doing the best I could with the information I had. Even now, I, I finally realized, some, I can't remember when I realized it, but I realized that I can manufacture those goosebumps. Physiologically, anatomically, I can move my neck in such a way that I produce those. I just, I just did it. I just felt the Holy Ghost. How about that? Well, I didn't really feel the Holy Ghost. That really wasn't a touch of God. It was a physiological experience that I could manufacture. And some would say, oh, what kind of hypocrisy and fakery and silliness is that? Well, it, it wasn't any, it, there was nothing to do with hypocrisy or faking in some duplicitous way. I, it was a, a young boy that was trying so desperately to know that God was with him, trying to believe that he would go to heaven instead of hell for eternity, that subconsciously he learned to manufacture ways to reassure himself. That's the world that I come from. That's the world that I knew. That's the world that many of you um, probably listening to me have come from, or at least some cognate or cousin of that. I, I lived in that world till I was 20 years old. And at 20 years old, and this is where I'll take a break in the story and I'll uh, leave you hanging for a week and we'll come back and pick up here next week because I don't want to drown you in the story. But again, I, 
I'm not telling you the story so you can take a test on the story of Stan Mitchell's life or remember all of these details. I'm really doing this more as an example. Um, an example for you to go back into your own story, um, to, to remember the child that you were, the adolescent that you were, the teen that you were, uh, the person who was a building block, the child, the adolescent, the teen, the, those building blocks and the fabric, the constitution of who you are now. Uh, to go back and to find ways to understand yourself better, to take responsibility for what needs to be taken responsibility for, but also to be able to give compassion to that child that was you. At 20 years old, I was preaching all over the country. I suppose I was an effective evangelist because uh, I had the equipment, I had the engine of oratory and the precociousness of mind that I could parrot the message really effectively. But I suppose the high octane fuel that drove that engine was my own angst, my own sense of insecurity, my own sense of desperately wanting to believe that I was okay with God. And so I preached hundreds of nights a year I preached and I preached and I preached trying desperately to convince not only the people I was preaching to but to convince myself that there was some way that I could be connected to God in a meaningful way that could last into eternity. So there I was entangled in a message that was damaging and damning, doing the best that I could with the information I had being loved by a group of people that I love dearly as well. And a Methodist preacher's wife that lived next door to us there in that little town called Perigold, Arkansas. One day she wandered across into our yard and I'll never forget as she was coming, I saw a little white something in her hands. That little white something in her hands turned out to be a book that she innocently wanted to give to me, that young preacher that lived next door. She had read it and she had so enjoyed it that she decided she was going to share it with someone else and I was the someone she was going to share it with. That little white book was written back in the early 80s. This would have been 1988 at the time, but the little white book was called On the Anvil and it was the first book written by Max Licato. It was written while he was a young missionary in Rio de Janeiro. She gave that book to me and she told me she thought I would enjoy it and I Remember when she walked off realizing that she didn't understand that I thought Methodist people were lost and Church of Christ people like Max Licato were lost. I remember thinking how nice and how pitiful that this poor lost Methodist woman would give me a book written by another heretical person, a Church of Christ preacher named Max Licato. And I, I took the book into the house trying to be nice and I put it underneath my bed. And, and another aside is I wasn't supposed to read that book because in that movement we really were not encouraged to read outside of our publishing house or outside the purview of our authors, especially as young ministers. We weren't supposed to read what was called external literature because it might corrupt our mind. And I held that book for a year. And after about a year, for some reason, I pulled it out from underneath that, my bed and I read that first little book called On the Anvil. I still say, some of the best writing Max Licato ever did were those first three. On the anvil, no wonder they call him the Savior, and God came near. Still good reading. And I read that first book, On the Anvil, and I remember being scandalized. Scandalized that a lost man, a Church of Christ, a non-fiddle-playing Camelite, we called him, could speak so eloquently and movingly about Jesus. I couldn't understand how someone who was lost could speak in a way that would move me about this one named Jesus that I followed. And a door cracked open in my mind. And the Holy Spirit actually did engage me, not through goosebumps cascading down my body, but in a way so gracious, tender, kind, and gentle a way that I will forever 
uh, I will forever remember gratefully. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said, The mind, once exposed to a better idea, can never shrink to its original size. And that day, as a 20, 21-year-old young preacher, my mind stretched and my heart opened. And a journey of deconstruction and new construction began. A journey that 30 years later, I'm still very much involved in. A journey that I wouldn't take anything for. So, there's a little bit. I just crammed into 25 minutes, 21 years of life. And it barely scratches the surface, but I think it hits the high points, the important points. So, love you, everybody, church. Think about your story this week, not just mine. Think about the nuances and the details of your story. Think about those places, those pivotal fulcrum moments where God came into your life in ways that you couldn't possibly have seen then. But now, in retrospect, you know that was indeed a divine presence working. Think about your life this week. Think about the story that you're grateful for. And be sure to give that kid, that teenager, that young person some compassion as you do your best to take responsible stewardship of the pieces of your life, pieces that God has cobbled together in some mad grace to make the person that you are today. I love you. I'll see you next week, and we'll pick up uh, there, and, and maybe we'll do this for the next couple of weeks. You guys have a great week, and be good to one another. There's plenty of pain in the world. Let's spread joy. And let's relieve suffering. Love you guys. Born out of eternity and into time Tiny cuts from daggers shooting from your eyes Silent disapproval Hope that you'll get right with God She's the only lover who has shown me grace Sorry to show up and rub it in your face But before you call her name To wallow in your shame did you stop to ask your daughter if she's happy? <sighs> it's enough to make your mind flip over backwards When the preacher's selling water to the well And the people pointing fingers at your happiness and joy Or so ever Starting fights Gabrielle and Juliet Lying nude and unashamed Can't you just be happy for us for a while She's the only person left Who makes me smile Silent disapproval, hope that you'll get right with God. It's enough to make your mind flip over.
everybody, church. My name is John. I approached Ray because I know that Ray and Stan are terrible at asking for money. And I'm going to ask you for money because I'm part of this community. When I was a little kid, my mom was really big about budgeting. So I think I was probably five or six, and she put these small little boxes in the top drawer of my dresser. The first box was the 10% box where I had to give back to God. Now, I would make money. I would, okay, I would scrape and rake the shag carpet of my neighbor across the street, and she'd give me a quarter. I would pick up acorns from one of my neighbors in buckets, the little sand buckets when I was a kid, and she'd give me like five cents a bucket or something like that. But 10% of that would always go back into the church bucket. So it was always the first box in my drawer. And just like the Bible says, you know, like we need to give back. And I've always felt like God has blessed me financially. Even when I don't feel like I have much, I've always had enough to meet my needs. So we need you to give and what we're asking is for 200 of you to give $20 a week. And you can make your payments recurring. So you don't even have to think about it every week. Just make it come out every month, and then you're supporting the ministry, and it's going to be consistent. Thank you so much, and may God bless you. See you soon.